Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Asia Thinker series organized by Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Thank you all for tuning uh, in today. I am Amanda Chong, and I have the pleasure of moderating this debate with two thought leaders in the field of economics and public policy, Professor Denny Kwa and Professor Walker, Walter Edgar Tessera. Um, the question we will be considering today is after the pandemic, building a fairer post-COVID-19 economy. And as we wait for people to trickle in uh, the live stream, perhaps I will begin by introducing our speakers first. So we have with us uh, Professor Danny Kwa, Dean and Lee Kashing Professor in Economics at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. His research interests include income inequality, economic growth, and international economic relations. Uh, Professor Kwa's current research takes an economic approach to world order with focus on global power shift and the rise of the East and alternative models of global power relations. And he has held academic posts at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the London School of Economics, where he has served as the head of the Department for Economics. Um, he has also served previously as a council member on Malaysia's National Economic Advisory Council and as consultant for the Bank of England, World Bank, and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And we have with us uh, Associate Professor Walter Edgar Tessera, who is currently serving as a nominated member of parliament in Singapore. He is an Associate Professor of Economics, School of Business, Singapore University of Social Sciences. And his areas are applied microeconomics, behavioral and experimental economics with policy research um, in the licensed money lending market in Singapore with the Ministry of Law, vehicle quota auctions with the Land Transport Authority and the Singapore Retirement and Health Survey. He has also served as a research consultant and advisor with the Economic Service of the Ministry of Trade and Industry, the Ministry of National Development, the Ministry of Social and Family Development and with the Civil Service College. And I am Amanda, a lawyer and poet with no formal economics qualifications, unlike our esteemed panelists. So I really approach this topic as a concerned citizen with a great interest in building a more equal world. What will happen in our 75 minutes together is first we will have our esteemed panelists engage in a short debate, followed by a round of questions from me. And we will then open up questions from the floor. So please do contribute your questions in the comments box uh, right below uh, this, this Facebook Live video. So we have seen that the pandemic has exposed and deepened fault lines of inequality around the world as the burdens have disproportionately fallen on those who can least afford to bear them. And we are seeing how unemployment, worldwide has hit those in the service economy who typically do not have a wide berth of savings. And we have come up against the incongruity of how many essential workers bear considerable health risks of working through a pandemic and yet do not have wages commensurate to the importance of their jobs. And in Singapore, we have seen the full social cost of our economy's heavy reliance on low wage foreign workers, housed in cramped conditions. And in the US, the Black Lives Matter uh, protests have highlighted not only police brutality, but also the deeper inequalities in access to housing, social protection, and medical care amongst Black Americans. And these fault lines of inequality, if left unchecked, can compromise the country's capacity to remain economically and politically stable as they erode the social compact between individuals, institutions, and the government. Yet, this also presents an unprecedented opportunity for change as governments worldwide are rethinking economic policies in the wake of the pandemic. The question then for our panelists is, should governments prioritize the management of inequality issues? What are the kinds of trade-offs that governments should be prepared to make to achieve a fairer economy post-COVID-19? So let us begin by hearing from our first speaker on this topic, Professor Danny Kwa. Thank you, Amanda, and good evening, everyone who's tuned in. Um, the, way that, the way that you've begun the conversation, Amanda, 
is exactly correct and appropriate. It points to how when COVID-19 struck, the poor and disadvantaged have borne the brunt of its impact. And it's pointed to how this, this disproportionate effects uh, indicate the potential that there's a profound weakness in the system. There are many reasons why we should want working and living conditions for the poor and vulnerable to improve. COVID-19 and this narrative adds to that. I would like to make in the time that I've got three points. The first point is that by focusing on this narrative, inequality, poor and vulnerable, COVID-19, disproportionate impact, profound weakness, we expose ourselves and our policy thinking to yet other blind spots. This narrative, correct that it is, is not sufficient. The second point I want to make is that in the case that I'm gonna develop, inequality is not the culprit. We need to look somewhere else if we're gonna be looking for profound weaknesses in the system. And the third point I want to make is actually perhaps an optimistic one in the midst of all this COVID-19 uh, dystopian environment that we see around us, that COVID-19 actually might contain within it the seed for how a better, more egalitarian, fairer society might emerge. Okay. So to pick up on these points, the first is, why do I think we've got the narrative not completely right? The key observation is the coronavirus does not go out and seek the bottom of the income distribution. It does not go and say, are you in the bottom 25%? If so, I will attack you. The coronavirus is concerned only about reproducing and spreading. And it looks at us humans, not in terms of an income distribution, but as its food, and as its Uber driver, it wants to feed on us and it wants us to carry it to other places. So given that that's what it wants to do, the crowded living conditions in foreign worker dormitories are of course ripe for it. But so are many other things. So are, yes, Brazilian favelas, so are Mumbai slums, so are Western European public housing projects, but middle-class, U.S. college kids on spring break in Florida, rich gated communities, naval aircraft carriers. There are many ways in which COVID-19 will find right fodder. And by focusing on foreign migrant workers, we have escaped, provided a blind spot for all these other channels. And we need to pay attention to that. The second is the reason that poorer workers are living together in crowded conditions. It's not because they're at the bottom of the income distribution. It's because they're poor. It's because they don't have opportunity and resources to buy into more uh, better working, better living and working conditions. The key problem here is not inequality. It is providing resources and opportunity for the poor to continue to access, to move up the social ladder. And then finally, my end point, the coronavirus might actually help us in all of this. I've argued that inequality is not where we should be looking. What we should be looking for are policies that help lift the poor. But what the coronavirus will do is it will remove our obsession with superstar outcomes that draw on reducing to the draw on maximizing efficiencies in the economy. Thomas Piketty's wonderful book on income inequality pointed to how the cause for income inequality was interest rates higher than the growth rate of the economy. Right now, the high returns to capital come from crowded central business districts, obsession over the financial services industry, putting people together to work in crowded conditions, and not just poor migrant workers, 
artists and scientists who want to bounce ideas off each other feel that by working cheek by jowl, elbow to elbow, they are at their most creative. COVID-19 is going to force us to rethink all of this. COVID-19 will force each of us to look at our neighbors and realize that we are a threat to them if we don't take care of ourselves. COVID-19 will teach us that we lift ourselves by raising the people around us because it is an epidemic. And so by removing this obsession and fetishism with superstar efficiencies, by allowing people to think more about society, to act in a more communitarian way, by removing the high rents from crowded central business districts, COVID-19 might actually bring about on its own a more egalitarian society, which would be a good thing all around. Thank you very much for your attention. Back to you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Danny, for that very interesting reflection on the democratizing effect of the coronavirus. I particularly enjoyed um, that very the evocative image of the virus being looking for Uber drivers um, in human beings. And, and I liked that you landed on um, how all of this actually forces us um, to think about acting in a more communitarian way, you know, and departing from the usual kind of self-interest and uh, maxima um, maximizing efficiency um, that, that has really been part of our development narrative for so long. Um, and now um, to, I'll give the time over to Professor Walter Tessera. Sure. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so I think uh, what the response to the COVID-19 pandemic by governments worldwide has really shown me is that there's been a systematic failure in many governments to actually understand and account for the effects of excessive inequality in policy making. And I think there are really two problems relating to high inequality that have characterized the COVID-19 policy response worldwide. Uh, first, I think many governments had great difficulty understanding ex ante that disparities in underlying health conditions in the types of work conditions of work people are you know, under, uh, living conditions, access to healthcare, all of these play a huge role in affecting the relative risk. And because of that, the death toll in some places has been much higher than it should have been. I'll give you just one example. Uh, COVID-19 outbreaks in care homes in North America they've been linked to practices such as care workers working across multiple homes and reporting for work when they're sick. But why is that the case? It's because wages are low, job security is poor, many care workers cannot survive without taking on multiple jobs or working when they're sick. And the root cause, you see, is that a lot of countries lack comprehensive social protection systems and regulations that address excessive inequality and the imbalance of power at work. And because of that, many workers are choosing between feeding their families and protecting public health. So it's the structure of our healthcare systems and the economy which prioritizes efficiency and often shifts the burden of reducing costs onto low-wage workers that's actually played a role in increasing the public health risk. And at this point, I think I want to agree with Professor Kwa that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic doesn't choose low-wage workers or vulnerable, vulnerable people to attack. But I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, do these workers actually have a meaningful choice? I have a choice. I can work from home. I can choose, for example, to prioritize my health and that of my family over earning an income because I've got quite a bit of savings. But a lot of workers out there do not have these choices. So I think it's, um, I think we have to go one step further and just say that the virus doesn't attack poor people. In particular, we have to recognize that poor people, because of the structure of the system, don't have meaningful choices they can make to avoid the virus sometimes. Okay. Second, I think uh, governments have difficulty, have had difficulty appreciating how policies to contain the public health risk from COVID-19 actually made existing unaddressed inequalities in society worse. And the lockdowns, for example, we all know they've hurt the poor disproportionately because social services and social safety nets haven't been able to catch up. And we've also seen there have been two parallel economic worlds. You've got one world for the well-off, technology-enabled professionals, they work from home, they've been paid throughout. You've got another world for informal and essential workers 
who've had their incomes collapse or they've had to go out and face COVID-19 risk to earn a living. I mean, when we started all of these lockdown policies, we didn't know much about transmission and fatality rates. And I think we were right on balance to prioritize public health. But we're committing staggering resources to protect the lives of the most vulnerable, and yet we're not willing to commit the same magnitude of resources to addressing these inequalities in the interest of improving public welfare. So going into the recovery now, I think the risk is that governments are going to be focused on economic recovery and employment without addressing these underlying structural problems in labor markets and the economy that subject too many workers to poorly paid and insecure work. There's going to be intense competition for jobs. That means benefits and wages will be under pressure. In the short run, this is going to look like a success story because boosting employment, that's more sustainable than indefinite welfare. I think we all agree on that. But in the long run, the pre-existing weaknesses that made many of our society so vulnerable to COVID-19 are not going to get addressed if we just stop there. So what I'm arguing here is not for a plan to eliminate inequality per se. Some inequality might be inherent to the way that the global economy and many societies are organized. The job of public policy rather is to address the consequences of these inequalities in a way that improves public welfare. If we don't address this, it leaves us more vulnerable to the next outbreak. And I think that, that's where we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thanks very much, Walter, for really sharpening our focus um, to look at the structural inequalities in society, especially in the labour markets. Um, and I think the metaphor that stood out to me really was the parallel worlds of your telecommuting PMETs versus your essential workers um, and how you know all of that is really evident of um, shifting the burden um, of how the economy has shifted the burden to certain people um, in order to remain more efficient. Um, and I thought that uh, we would begin this discussion by going back to first principles um, because the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy team did a poll prior to this panel on, on various social media platforms. Um, and we found that 90% of people um, voted that countries should focus on building a stable and fairer economy over economic growth. And it made me think that I think fair is a term that needs to be unpacked because it is really easy to get behind as like a broad value. But when we break it down, we realize that we often mean very different things. Um, and I know that Danny has argued in his academic writing um, that what countries should be looking at is social mobility rather than inequality as a metric for fairness. And Walter, you just mentioned um, this idea of having meaningful choices. Um, so my question to the both of you is, what does a fairer economy or fairness mean to you? Um, and I ask this question in a broad philosophical sense. Um, so what metrics, economics or otherwise, should we be paying attention to um, as we consider fairness? Oh, um, Professor uh, Danny, I think you're on mute. <laughs> but please feel free to address the question. Okay, no, I, I was indicating that I thought Walter might want to go first, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to, to take up the challenge, Amanda. <laughs> um, I would like to, to address your question, if I may, also by reflecting on some of the things that, that Walter has said. Uh, and I think that Walter might then be able to, to come back on, on this. Um, your question about what each of us, you know, thinks about as fairness. I, I, base what I think about this on the studies that I've undertaken of how inequality and, and social dynamics have changed around the world. There's no society where there's no inequality, none. And I also realized that in some societies where inequality is actually quite low, those might not be very pleasant societies to live in. If I were given fair choice, I would opt out of them. You can have a society that's completely egalitarian. Everybody has exactly the same level of income, but everyone is dirt poor. Now, that would be fertile ground for COVID-19 because there's no getting out. Everybody is a target. So it's not inequality being high or low. 
that's critical for either COVID-19 or for fairness, in my view. For fairness, in my view, is uh, it's very much tied with ideas about about democracy and and, uh, and 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 other ideals. It's that there be a level playing field. Everybody gets a fair shot. There's fairness. There's opportunity and resources made available. There's opportunity for everyone, and resources made available for those who have, through no fault of their own, suffered disadvantages. So they're they're born into unfortunate circumstances. Say they need a helping hand. Those are good, in my view, good societies to be in. Okay. And fairness in that description does not mean no inequality. Conversely, inequality does not mean that there's no fairness. So to pick up on this, uh, and I would like at this point to, to reflect on what Walter said, and maybe Walter can come back in his response. Because Walter says very correctly that right now, COVID targets the poor and vulnerable. Well, unfortunate circumstances, they have to make choices such that they expose themselves even more to the disease. And all of that is, is absolutely accurate, lamentable. We should fix that. Is that an issue of inequality though? Because I could imagine a society where everyone is equally poor, everybody has to do that. And in terms of our view of COVID-19, what it seeks to do. It does not go around to societies and, says to pe and say to people, oh, are you in the bottom 10% of the population? Because if you are, I am for you. But if you're in the top 90, in the top 10%, I will not. COVID-19 does not do that. It looks at crowded situations. So the crowded conditions that Walter describes that COVID-19 has attacked also would be the same reasoning where it attacks middle-class PMET workers who are commuting to work on a commuter train in Connecticut, the United States, say, or who are clustered together in a central business district at a business lunch. It doesn't matter to the coronavirus. All it cares about, whether you are rich or poor, top 10%, bottom 40%, all that matters is in a crowded situation, you are food, you are its transportation. So, it's not inequality, that's the critical thing here, is that the poor at this point don't have the opportunity and resources to buy themselves out of that crowded situation. The rich people choose to put themselves in that situation. The solution to that is not to eradicate inequality or to lower it, but to give the poor and vulnerable more opportunity and resources to allow them to be able to choose to buy out of that situation. And the kind of social compact that we should be aiming for is a compact that focuses on the well-being of the poor, weak, and vulnerable, not a social compact that looks with skilled eyes at inequality, as whether it's good or bad. Let me end there, and then we can come back to this on your fairness issue, Amanda. Thank you. Walter, would you like to respond to Danny on this? Yeah, I guess I'd like to first talk a bit about fairness, I think, from the viewpoint of economics. Uh, and then maybe I'll talk a bit about, um, yeah, about my response to Danny's comments. Okay, so I think, um, you know, I think on fairness, it, it's always been a bit of a difficult topic for economists because there's no objective, I think, definition of fairness. Uh, but nonetheless, there is research in economics that does look at it. For example, if you look at the pioneering research from Kahneman, Knetsch, and Taylor, uh, you know, they show that people care about fairness and they make economic decisions based on their sense of fair play. It really matters. And I think the important point I want to highlight here is that there's actually a contrast between people's sense of fairness and market forces. Let me give you a very classic example from their research. You know, they ask people, um, you know, imagine that you've got a store in town, it sells, it sells snow shovels. And, you know, normally it sells for, let's say, $10 or something. And all of a sudden, there's a big snowstorm. And guess what? People really need to buy these snow shovels. So do you think it's going to be fair if the store suddenly hikes the price of the snow shovels? Now, an economist says this is supply and demand. What's the big deal? But it turns out most regular people think this kind of decision is terribly unfair. And so the point here is that market forces says one thing. Uh, the logic of the market says one thing. But 
people's sense of principles of fairness actually say something else entirely. And in general, people believe that prices and wages in a market economy should be set in some way according to principles of fairness. Not completely, but people believe that prices and wages have to be justified one way or another. It could be through effort, the cost of production, it could be through hard work. And I think people thinking about it more broadly also believe that institutions should play a role in regulating a market economy. Government accountability, rule of law, having a level playing field, as Danny says, that's actually important because justice and the access to justice is an important element of fairness. And I think going further, I think having reasonable protection for people when they stumble, whether that's in the form of social safety net, income security, that's important because a lot of the challenges people face that reduce their incomes or hurt their families are not due to any lack of effort on their part, they're due to chance alone. If you know you happen to take up a new job in a hotel in January, you know, it's uh you probably won't have that job today. And that's got nothing to do with whether you're working hard or not, right? It's got to do with the fact that COVID-19 has shut down all travel. So how do you then measure fairness? Um, I think it's going to be hard to measure it directly, but I would argue that because I think it's an important fundamental human principle, it has to contribute, I think, in some way to our sense of societal well-being. And what we see worldwide is that, you know, surveys con suggest that economies with institutions and outcomes that we think seem fair, democratic institutions, the rule of law, stakeholder capitalism, social safety nets, they also have populations who express high well-being. And I'm going to agree if here, here with Danny, of course, that uh, I think a population would not express a high level of well-being if they were equal, but everybody there was, you know, quite dirt poor. Uh, that, that would be very difficult. That would be a very difficult life to live in. But the point I want to make, I think, in response to him is that if we've got sufficient resources, and I think we do in Singapore, I think we do in any uh, sufficiently developed economy, then isn't it a shame that we're not willing or able to direct some more of those resources towards providing these protections for the most vulnerable among us? Unless we're making the argument, and I don't think Danny is making an argument, that inequality is necessary for societal progress, for income gains. And what I mean here is a high level of inequality is actually necessary to drive this forward somehow. You know, I'm not sure why we can't use some of these excess resources that we have to try to address some of these issues. Not because, you know, we're trying to drive down the Gini coefficient to a certain level just because uh, we think arbitrarily that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's about addressing the real weaknesses and the real challenges that people, especially poorer workers, face in a society. Thanks very much, uh, Walter. And I think actually this segues quite nicely into um, the next question um, that I had plan to ask, and, and Danny, please obviously feel free to go back to talk about fairness um, as you respond to this next question. Um, but based on the, the views advanced earlier, um, I understand that, that Danny to be arguing that a move from global efficiency, you know, this kind of maximalist um, superstar efficiency, um, as you termed it, um, to building local resilience in our economy will necessarily create a fairer economy. Um, and, and my question is, can we really take this for granted? Or do governments need to directly address inequality through policies as Walter suggests? Yeah, thank you for that, Amanda. I think uh, this is not something that's just the, the old regime, as it were. It's not just going to roll over and die. There are many vested interests uh, that, that attempt to keep the economy going in a certain way, even when, it, as in the current situation, it is clear that it is beneficial for all of us, everyone, to take greater pains at, uh, at lifting up the weakest links in society, uh, to make sure that the, the, the poor and vulnerable, the weak, are taken care of so that they don't themselves become vectors, Uber drivers for the coronavirus. All of that makes sense. And none of that is going to happen automatically. However, there is an organic direction. The organic forces are pushing in the direction against the kind of system that we have seen over the late 20th century. This headlong rush 
for squeezing out you know, every single inefficiency in the system and people getting paid huge amounts for doing that. Collateralized debt obligations, securitized financial assets, uh, ever more innovative uh, in financial instruments were a way that people were using the financial services industry was using to squeeze out every last iota of inefficiency in our system. And in doing that, brought the system to a state of fragility that in the 2008 global financial crisis, the global economy collapsed almost as badly as it's collapsing now. So, you know, and that was entirely human made, entirely artificial. So none of this is going to be automatic. However, there are underlying forces at work. So again, you know, Thomas Piketty's, you know, grand thesis on capitalism and inequality is a very simple idea and it's a very automatic one. It says when you've got capital assets that earn higher rates of return than the rest of the economy is growing, inequality is going to rise. That's it. That's the only story there. And what I'm saying is that the COVID-19 situation, pandemic and its recovery will actually attempt to reverse that inequality, will attempt to push those forces in the opposite direction. That's not the end of the story, but if you believe that there was a simple story generating inequality, here's a counter story now pushing in the opposite direction. So I think, um, I think there's no direct connection necessarily uh, between globalization, the global efficiency that we, we've seen, um, and I mean, between reducing, for example, our exposure to globalization or global efficiency and improving um, improving inequality or just improving outcomes, I think, at the local level. So, so let me just expand on that a bit. I think, I think one of the reasons why concerns about uh, globalization take such a center stage in discussions of inequality and economic outcomes is that it's convenient for people to blame many bad things on globalization. I mean, you know, um, global markets for capital and labor, they often result in changes at the local level that people think are deeply unfair. When your factory closes down because, uh, you know, setting up the factory again in another country is going to be much cheaper for the company and therefore they're going to make more profits. Of course, to the workers, that seems like a terribly unfair result. When you've got a fairly, you know, open immigration for labor and as a result of that, you're seeing more competition for jobs and your employer is less pressure to raise wages, you think that's very unfair. So I think in, in some way, this global drive to efficiency, I agree with Danny, it, um, it, it seems to provide a neat cause and effect story, right? For what is driving inequality and bad outcomes or unfairness as we perceive it. But I think it's also possible uh, that inequality is unfortunately a feature of human society at some scale. And to some extent, perhaps, you know, the desire to exploit others could also be an inherent feature of human society. And so it's actually kind of a miracle, if you think about it, that we have developed societal systems to try to curb our own tendencies to do this. Um, I think, so, so let's think about a world which is less globally connected and more local. Would inequality and would unfairness be lower automatically because of it? I think it may be correct to assume that social connectedness could make people less likely to exploit each other. For example, if you've got a firm and all your employees in Singapore are local, uh, it is possible that you might treat them better, you might be more sympathetic to them, you might, you know, work out things in a more stakeholder-oriented way compared to the case when uh, you are hiring a lot of what seems to you to be fairly faceless and interchangeable foreign workers. Okay, but I think you cannot rely on this. And I think, you know, to, to sound a note of caution, I think we have to remember that uh, you know, institutions like slavery were terrible, and yet a number of slave owners seem to sincerely believe that they were doing the best they could for their slaves. I mean, you know, there, there are documents, there are records of, of uh, slave owners justifying their behavior according to that principle. And so I think, um, you know, what, what should give us some pause for concern here is that unless we're in a situation where we're truly able to treat others as stakeholders, uh, our employees as equal partners in our enterprise, um, you know, we really have to see people as equal human beings. Without that, I think we cannot rely on just, 
local production, local employment, uh, you know, reliance on, on um, local markets, we can't rely on that alone to address problems of inequality and unfairness. Yeah, we do need, I think, government policy. Can I follow up on what Walter just said? His last statement, we need government policy. And I realized, Amanda, that that was your, your question as well. Do we need government policy? And in particular, in your gentle poet's way, you didn't phrase the follow-on question is, what kind of policies do we actually need rather than do we need it or not? So let me try and answer both, you know, the direction that both of you were saying. What kind of policies? Because... You know, I, I, you know, it might sound like I'm being, you know, particularly, you know, uh, just looking at the world with rose tinted glasses. COVID-19, once it's over, we'll be in a flatter income distribution. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that it's pushing the forces in the other direction. What are the concrete things governments, policymakers might want to think about? Okay. So, so the first thing is COVID-19 is far from over. We're still, you know, as, as PM Lee said a few minutes ago, we're only at the end of the beginning. We're not even you know, anywhere close to having a vaccine or anything else. So we need to move very carefully. And COVID-19 and other pandemics or other public uh, health emergencies like this can only be repaired by governments, the state, civil society, and all the rest of the community coming together. No single agent will be able to fix this by themselves. So it comes from applying science, but also changing our social behavior. Everybody has to play a part. Now, if we take that and we say, how does that bear on the inequality issue? How do we nudge the COVID-19 sort of story along so that we get a better outcome in inequality? It, it seems to me that in addition to all the things that we already have to do to try and mitigate and recover from COVID-19, there are specific things we can think about in terms of inequality. The world in general takes two kinds of approaches to inequality. One is an approach that restricts people's freedoms, and the other is an approach that opens up people's freedoms, allows them to do more. And both of these are, are potential ways forward. So the part, what are the strategies, what are policies and measures that restrict people's freedoms? punitive wealth taxes, exorbitantly high income taxes to try and redistribute. Uh, these things confine the behavior of specific segments of the population, restrictions on capital and labor flows. And in a sort of brutal arithmetic sense, you can lower inequality that way. And for some observers, you know, there's a sense of job done. We have lowered inequality that way. But I think it would be very unsatisfactory for a society like, like, like ours that sees itself sustaining a trajectory going forward if we left the story at that. What we need to think about are measures that help, COVID that help bring about the COVID-19 recovery, but that open up people's freedoms. Okay? And what are those? Well, these are measures that are... Uh, that, that actually I, I see in some nations around us, but not all, uh, subsidizing job opportunities, okay. allowing uh, firms job support so they can smooth out fluctuations in labor demand. These help mitigate COVID-19's economic impact. They help the poor and vulnerable. They keep, us, they keep societies on a stable trajectory and they allow a resumption of economic activity as recovery happens, these are things that open up opportunities. Longer term, schooling, reskilling, upskilling, uh, improving access to education, all of these things will help both the COVID-19 mitigation and recovery and open up opportunities for people to a more egalitarian society, to a fairer society. So I think there are very specific things governments and policymakers can do. It's not just let's wait for COVID-19 to be over because then we'll be okay. Back Thank to you. you, Amanda. Thank you very much. And um, you have very organically taken the conversation to where I wanted to go to next and talking about institutional and individual behavior. Um, because in many ways, we have seen that the pandemic has, changed, uh, has challenged many assumptions about individual and collective good. You know, we see that in panic buying to mask wearing um, and, you know, different attitudes towards both. Um, so how has the pandemic um, impacted individual and institutional behavior in relation to the economy. Um, and 
you know, are there any new impulses that militate against fairness that we no need to look out for? Or what does this mean for fairness in the long run? Like all these changes in, in institutional and individual behavior. Excellent. Well, uh, Walter, you go ahead. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so, so I think first I, I want to say that uh, the individual behaviors we've seen in response to COVID-19 are, are not all bad. Uh, I mean, mask wearing and voluntary mask wearing, I think, is one such um, is one such example. Another, I think, particularly heartening example is how many people have actually uh, tried to contribute to charity. They've actually created new charitable organizations and ground up efforts to support those who are most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think uh, in the process, they should also show us uh, if we are more sober, if we assess things more critically, they should also show us the limitations of indi individual behavior as a response to dealing with a social society-wide pandemic. Um, to take food security for an example, it's something which has actually um, tugged at the hearts of many Singaporeans. We've heard many stories about how people who don't have a lot are actually giving of their time, uh, finding resources to feed their neighbors and so on. But what we will realize if we look at what's going on is that there are many people trying to help the food insecure among us, and yet there's not a lot of coordination because everybody is trying to do the best they can to help the people whom to them are the most visible and in need of help. And as a whole of society, we actually still don't know what are the unmet or unaddressed gaps in food insecurity in Singapore. To my knowledge, we haven't done a publicly available survey or data collection effort of how many people in Singapore are actually food insecure. And these kinds of efforts, that's something that honestly, I think only government is actually well positioned to do. And so I think the appropriate role for charity and individual efforts is actually to fill in the gaps in areas or things that government is not equipped to do or not able to customize its services for. If I think about food insecurity, I think it's actually the role of society, that is the government, to actually find out what are the issues, gaps, and what's the best way to address them to provide a minimum level of nutrition to as many people as possible. But then, of course, after that, you've got a lot of special needs. You've got people with special diets due to illnesses they have. Maybe you've got expecting mothers. You've got all sorts of groups, which I think charitable ground of efforts are very well placed to customize additional help for. But I think it's a bit problematic if we're relying on all of these small efforts to actually fulfill basic social needs. I think that's a problem. Um, another thing I issue, I think, relating to your later point about your second question about new impulses against fairness. Um, one problem I see increasingly in Singapore is this resorting to a strange moral relativism in terms of our standards of fairness. So instead of subscribing to universal human standards of fairness, we're basically saying it's fair to do one thing if you're a migrant worker, and it's fair to do another thing if you're Singaporean, right? So that is why when you look at the debate about the treatment of migrant workers, a common refrain you see is that uh, people are upset, Singaporeans are upset, that we're providing, for example, catered food, accommodations, and so on to them, healthcare. And why are Singaporeans upset? Because they're saying that what we're providing is already very good, too good, in fact, by the standards of their home countries. And so it's a very curious moral relativism that says that it's one set of you know, results for Singaporeans and another set for these people. And I think we have to be very careful about that because it's no leap of logic to suggest that the same idea could then apply to other Singaporeans as well, who happen to belong to a category you don't like, you know? So you could say, well, you know, some Singaporeans are deserving of this standard of fairness, this other group, not so much, you know? And I, I think we have to really be careful there. Um, I think the last point I just wanted to touch on briefly is a bit in response to, I think, what uh, Danny was saying earlier. You know, I think, um, I think there's, I think it is not necessary to couch our policy response to COVID-19 as a binary choice between restricting freedoms and having completely open freedoms. And I don't think he would want to restrict it, you know, to a binary choice either. Um, you know, if, if you think about, for example, the discussion about 
taxes, the restrictions on movement and so on and people, I think it's really about the point of view that you have about the narrative that you construct around, for example, taxation. Is taxation expropriation of people's uh, wealth and earnings, or is it actually a contribution that people are making for the social stability and government institutions that help them to generate that wealth? I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Because I think if you talk to any uh, extremely high net worth individual, any billionaire, for example, in the developing world, who's made their money by building up a corporation, a conglomerate from scratch, I think they'll tell you that for them to recreate the social stability and security purely privately would be an incredibly ruinously expensive task. Can you imagine that, you know, for example, if the largest department store owner in a developing country had to pay entirely out of their own pocket for all of the private security, for all of the road building, for everything that goes on in order to allow them to expand their commercial empire and build their wealth. So I think if you look at it from that point of view, it's only fair that they pay something to create the social conditions necessary for them to build the wealth. The question, of course, is how much is that something? How high should it be? And I think that is, of course, a very difficult question to answer. But we have to be aware of the fact that pushing too much towards completely open, uh, completely um, free markets, uh, complete open competition, especially in the area of tax competition between countries, is unfortunately likely to lead us down a route where individuals make their wealth in some countries and don't pay for the social conditions necessary for their wealth to be created and sustained in those countries. And that's a problem that I think all of us globally have an interest in preventing. That, that's excellent, Walter. I really like the way you've couched the, the decision. And I thought I might build on what Walter said uh, and, and circle back to some of Amanda's original concerns. You know, this potential tension between individual behavior and what works for society, what works for the community, you know, which, is, which is what Walter was, was, uh, was, was describing as well. Uh, I'll put it down even, even more succinctly. How do you get people to do the right thing? How do you get people to do the right thing, not just for themselves, but for their neighborhoods, for their families and friends, the community they live in and the society that they are part of? How do we align incentives so that individuals end up doing what's good for the society, for the community? That's what we're trying to build here. And we're, we're here discussing, having a conversation about whether COVID-19 enables an architecture that helps us do that. Now, it used to be in normal times, by normal times, I mean pre-COVID-19, pre-deglobalization, going all the way back to the early 2000s, late 1990s. There was a simple way to think about this. And that was uh, maybe a Western-style liberal ideal. You do good in society, by doing well for yourself, by building your business, by, by pursuing your interests, by being the entrepreneur, you have advanced society. So all you ever need to do is be concerned about your own individual bottom line. And then the world changed. We had the 2008 global financial crisis where we realized financial markets completely failed in achieving that kind of optimality. And now we've got like the mother of all global externalities, a coronavirus, where my behavior transmits the virus to my neighbors. This is like the complete opposite of the world 20, 25 years ago. How do we repair this when we no longer have that simple dictum? Do good for society by doing well for yourself. I think that you know, what we're trying to do now at the school and elsewhere is trying to engage in research that looks at, you know, in technical terms, what economists think about as externalities. And here, issues of trust, the social compact, all become hugely important. The social compact that you know, senior minister Tarman was describing when he said, this is what we need to do going forward to keep our people to, together, to keep our people socially coherent. Uh, my colleague, Alfred Wu, 
just finished the study where he, he, he considered whether levels of trust across different jurisdictions help predict levels of trust in the government, in the authorities, help predict face mask wearing behavior, conformity to social distancing, all that. And it turns out, yes, if you trust the people who are telling you to do these things, you are more likely to do that. The opposite extreme we see, you know, in among elsewhere in the world, the United States, where, you know, people are going around saying, if you wear a face mask, you are being un-American. You are not doing what the nation wants you to do, which is like the complete opposite of what the entire world at this point believes. You know, we used to worry about how authoritarian states like North Korea had one level of sensibility inside while the rest of the world believes something else. Now we're seeing that kind of sensibility emerge in the most open among the oldest of democracies. The whole world's been turned upside down. What do we do to come back to aligning people's incentives so that they end up doing the right thing? I think what it means is to continue to build the fabric of civil society, to continue for, for engagement and conversations like this, and research like my colleagues at the school to help us understand what it is that keeps the social compact together. Because we no longer have the old adage, just do well for yourselves and you'll end up doing good for society. So I think it really is something completely different that we need to navigate. And we need to do that cautiously. We need to do that in a way that doesn't close down, shut down personal freedoms. Because it's quite natural to think that. Because you know, back in the old days, it was personal freedom that drove that narrative. It is so tempting to think the opposite will get us to the right place. It won't. We need to be thinking about individuals and states, civil society, communities, all need to be collaborative in this new world where a sneeze is no longer just something that can be forgiven by someone saying, excuse me, because it's something completely different now. So back to you, Amanda. Thank you very much. And finally, I really wanted to just take this back home to Singapore. And, and in some ways, I've already done that, referring to the specific social compact that um, Senior Minister Thaman spoke about, which was of balancing self-effort and selflessness in, in Singapore culture. So my, my question um, in relation to Singapore is that um, we have been discussing inequality in the global context. And what is similar about inequality in Singapore? Um, and what is different in terms of the forces that are shaping it. Um, and I'm going to tap on a question that I saw in the Facebook comments um, from Tabby. What can Singapore do to lessen the impact of a global recession um, to those hit the most within our society? I'll let Walter uh, sure. come in on that first. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so first, I think, um, and, and this follows on a bit to, uh, you know, what Danny was discussing earlier, I think social narratives, uh, our social understanding of why the world is the way it is, it's very important for understanding inequality. One of the things that comes out from research is that people have systematically biased views on the extent and impact of inequality and also the causes of it. You know, for example, there's a lot of interesting research from uh, Professor Stephanie Stancheva at Harvard and others that shows that Americans systematically overestimate the chances of social mobility. Uh, you know, they, they think that they're much more likely to climb up the social mobility ladder than the data actually suggest they really are. And, you know, so believing that riches are just within reach, that gives society a very strong rationale for, for accepting not just inequality, but also accepting the status quo in terms of the lack of any effective government policy to address it. Because why would you want government policy to address it when you think that you or your kids have an excellent chance of actually climbing all the way up, right? I mean, that's against your own self-interest. So turning to Singapore, what's our narrative? I think our narrative is probably meritocracy as an explanation for many things, including inequality. And I think uh, meritocracy is not in itself a bad thing. The best parts of it, which is the idea that you should have people who are qualified, suitable, competent for the task that they do, that allows all of us to contribute to society. 
And, you know, in some way, I think it feeds into our social acceptance of some level of inequality because we think that what we see out there is a result of people rising to the top of their fields or professions through their own ability and hard work. But what's the bad thing? Setting aside whether social mobility in Singapore is as good as it could be for the moment, right? That's a subject which I think, you know, can be a whole other debate. I think there is not necessarily uh, a logical connection between having people do the tasks that they're best suited for, that's meritocracy, and having people in some of those tasks take a huge share of the gains to society. We can all agree, for example, that we need competent, highly qualified doctors, that's obvious. But there's a vast difference between Singapore and the US, for example, where you have superstar doctors who earn millions and nationalized healthcare systems where the doctor's earnings are good, but they're not so grossly unbalanced at the top end. And in fact, I think if you look at quality, I do wonder whether you see the same difference, for example, in quality that the logic of the market and meritocracy would have you believe, right? You'd believe that in Singapore and the US, the doctors must be magnitudes more skilled and more capable than doctors in the UK, for example, because they have a largely nationalized healthcare system, but is that actually true? And um, a counterpoint, for example, is Cuba, which very famously has extremely well-qualified doctors, even though it can't be uh, a source to riches, you know, a pathway to riches there as it is in a uh, more capitalist-run economy. So I think uh, for me, dealing with it on a social level, it's about embracing, at least in Singapore, the positive aspects of meritocracy, but not accepting that there must be an immutable connection between that concept of meritocracy and a grossly high level of inequality. I think that's um, actually part of the key here. Yeah. Okay, if, if I may pick up, Amanda, on what Walter said, I, I would like to also to make some of the same points that he has, but say that maybe slightly differently with different emphases slightly. Um, uh, first is in, on the question itself, both Amanda from you and from the, our, our audience. I think that it, you know, it is key not to go through this lockdown, circuit breaker and post circuit breaker period and end up losing our social and human capital. We need to keep all of that economic engine sort of ticking over. We need to have our instincts on how to, to work appropriately, do business, all still alive. And I think we're, we're doing that. We're being very careful in, in, in figuring out which sectors are, uh, will, will continue, to be, continue to be active. Uh, there's job support, there's investment, co-financing, uh, co there's wage subsidies, all of which keep that economic engine ticking over. Nobody is under any illusion that even though, even though you know, we're spending 100 billion in, in these kinds of schemes, that that means that the level of economic activity will be the same as it was pre-COVID. But that's not the point. The point is just to keep things ticking over. At the same time that we do that, we need to be prepared for the upturn when it comes around, which means upskilling and reskilling, preparing ourselves for a more digital, technology intensive infrastructure. And it doesn't just mean P the PMET classes that work with that. Digital telecommuting, uh, telehealth is something that's been hugely impactful in Indonesia and India among very, very poor people. And we need to be prepared for that kind of change in the way we work. So I think that, that preparedness is something that we need to keep. And that's the first plank. The second plank is we need to be absolutely ruthless in how we focus in on the challenges that we face. I have a slight, I have, I have a bit of a worry that inequality, like the words democracy and meritocracy, means so many different things to so many different people. It is so easy to point a finger at inequality and say, this is what's to blame for everything. So I go back to what, the, what does the world look like? You know, I've used the example already of situations where Everybody is, the society is egalitarian, but everybody is equally poor, not a good place to be. Over the last 40 years, American inequalities, growth, the growth rate of American inequality is almost unmatched in the world. American inequality has risen at such rapid rates. There's only one place in the world that outstrips it in terms of a rate of increase in inequality, and that's China. 
Okay, so these are two societies, the largest uh, largest economies that we the world has today, both on this massive upwards trajectory in inequality. However, the life experience of ordinary citizens in China and America are very different. In America, the top 10% have seen their incomes increase threefold. The bottom 50% have seen their incomes actually fall. That's why inequality is so high. In China, yes, inequality has grown faster than America, but the top 10% have seen their incomes rise tenfold, while the bottom 50% have seen their incomes also rise fourfold. So although inequality is higher in China now than it has been for decades, the poor in China are immeasurably better off. They have seen incomes rise faster, the poor in China, faster than even the rich in America have seen their incomes rise. So by focusing on inequality, we would have lost all of that richness. We bring this back to Singapore, we need to be focused. What is it that we're concerned about? Is it the well-being of the weak and vulnerable? That's what we should focus on. And if inequality is not, as the statisticians say, a sufficient statistic for that, let's punt on inequality. Let's not obsess about it. And I guess my, my last point really is that, you know, we, we use these words, equality, fairness, meritocracy, democracy, and, and each of us, is free to interpret in the way that's favorable to us. So I like to think in terms of, are we, do we have a level playing field? Does everyone have a shot? Is there opportunity available for all? Those who are rendered uh, by a state of nature, by something beyond their control, whether because they're born in that way, if they faced an accident, are uh, made more vulnerable, we should provide, we should extend a helping hand. And I think it's these little things that we need to put together that will keep the social compact, social coherence strong that we can go forwards. And I, although as an academic, I do have to deal in these words, I feel that for, for formulating policy, either we define them really carefully, otherwise we need to be extremely scrupulous about how we, we, we use them in conversation. Thank you very much, um, Danny and Walter, for your responses. And in those responses, you actually very presently answered some of the questions that we had from the audience. Um, there was, in fact, um, two questions from CNBC Blanche Lim. Um, and uh, it was asked whether meritocracy was a solution to the problem of inequality, which Walter answered. And there was another question from CNBC also on um, US and China and the income inequality gap, which Danny covered. So uh, we actually have managed to, to get through some of these questions that have um, been coming up from the floor. Um, but um, I understand from the organizers that uh, we do have until 6.30 um, to take further questions from the audience. So I'll just go ahead with asking you a few more. Um, so we have a question from Lupin. Um, to either of the panelists, how will this current crisis lead to eventual deglobalization and how impactful will this deglobalization be um, in affecting the Singapore economy in both the long and short run? Um, who would like to take that question? <laughs> Walter, do you want to go? Do you want to go first? Well, I, I, honestly, I think uh, Danny is actually the real expert here in globalization. Um, but but let, let me just talk a bit about what my concerns are with possible deglobalization in Singapore. But I think he would have a more informed perspective on whether it's going to happen or not. Um, you know, I, I think um, what we should be particularly concerned about as Singaporeans is the possibility that the kinds of work we do in Singapore can be easily offshored. And that's something which I think the risk of that has really gone up, I think, of COVID-19 and we work from home for a couple of reasons. One is um, a lot of the regional headquarters business that we have actually depends crucially on business people being able to travel freely. That's why we have prioritized trying to get travel arrangements back for essential business. We're doing it because we understand that if it doesn't come back, then more and more companies are going to ask the question, why have a regional issue in Singapore? I'm just going to move it to Jakarta, Bangkok, wherever it is. So that's one risk. The other risk, of course, is that unfortunately, Singaporeans are 
uh, fairly expensive workers, you know, globally, as expensive as workers in any other key global city. And just like those other key global cities, there's going to be some pressure uh, if work from home, you know, actually works out successfully. It's not just work from home in Singapore, it's work from home anywhere globally. And it means expatriates returning to their home countries, but still overseeing regional operations here. It also means good um, office jobs, PMAT jobs going uh, to the region because workers there are cheaper and can perform similar quality of work. So no issue there, right, for the employers. So, you know, so, so in a way, I think it's um, part of it is a story of deglobalization or at least the, um, well, I don't quite know how to describe it. Uh, the global process, I think, the point is, I think these global processes will go on, but there's no need for these processes, uh, these business value-added processes to take place in Singapore. That's the real threat. I think that we face, uh, that the rest of the world will just march on by itself, but without Singapore as a key uh, global hub in that. I think that's a real danger that we're facing. Okay. In the interest of time, if I may, I can just make two points. One is that uh, exactly as, as Walter says, I agree, I agree with what he says. On the, on the globalization part, I, you know, I, I think globalization is something very simple. It's just the increasing ease with which anything that's made on earth is available to anyone anywhere on the planet. So if you can have that, then you've got globalization. So, but the way that the world has approached globalization, there's actually very modern, almost 25th century Star Trek type idea is with industrial revolution, 19th century ways of imagining. So we think about creating chains where we move one bit of a, of a screwdriver from here to another part of Earth, and then we move what the screwdriver had operated on to Israel, and then we move that to Singapore, and then it moved, you know, and that's, and, and we stand back and we marvel at that, and we think, wow, that's an amazing web of globalization. That's industrial age globalization. We should be reimagining how it is we achieve this kind of facility of making the things on earth available to all of humanity. And I think we can do that. But in the meantime, in the short term, because we've inherited this, there is, I think, no question that in the short term, 18 months, 24 months, globalization, economic activity will have to suffer, will, will suffer. We'll have to rethink global supply chains, the risk associated with how we've drawn them in a way that previously obsessively chased efficiency and pay very little attention to weak links and resilience. We will need to rewire all of that, and that will take time. There's some, and then my second point is, how will an economy like Singapore's deal with all of this rewiring? Because not least, tourism, uh, you know, travel are hugely important parts of the Singapore economy, just as being a hub is for knowledge and a range of other things. Here, I would say again, we need to reimagine what the tourism and travel industry is. In the short term, any industry, any economic activity that requires people to be crowded together, there's no way around it. You will suffer. Th that's it. That's going to happen. Universities will have to rethink. Airline jetliners will have to rethink. Aircraft carriers, holiday cruises, all of these will have to rethink. Because that all way of doing things is no longer appropriate for a world where there's a pandemic possibility. But then you realize we actually, for a lot of that, we don't actually need people crowded together. If you want to experience things, there are efficient, faster ways to, to, to undergo experiences than actually having to physically be there. I know people like to recite, oh, it's, it's different when you're there. But, you know, it, we didn't used to travel on jetliners. Now we do, and we don't even think twice about it. It's simply a matter of reimagining what's possible. How will Singapore retain its, its, its centrality in the world? I think, you know, uh, for, uh, Foreign Minister Vivian Balakrishna gave a wonderful speech just in the last couple of days on how trust embedded in Singapore continues to be strong. And this is trust in expertise, in governance, in public management. And it's that trust that will not be, that, that we will need to continue to sustain 
that will not be undermined by this inability to get crowds together, and that will carry Singapore through into the next uh, into the next line of industrial activity. But we need to shed these old industrial age ideas of how we do business. COVID-19 will accelerate, it will fast forward that. Oh, back to you, Amanda. Thank you very much. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I will ask one question specifically to both, uh, to either panelists, uh, followed by one final question, which we'll treat as the summation um, and the conclusion of this panel. Um, so this question is for Walter and it's from Andrew Bing. Um, and the question is, Wage inequality across informal um, slash gig sectors only now recognized as essential is evidence of a lack of efficiency in terms of recognition slash remuneration for services deemed essential. What will it take for our society to recognize that a good level of services demand fair and even good wages? So this is very in line with what you have been speaking up about in parliament. You know, I, I think I'm going to address this problem by, again, I think trying to contrast what market forces tell us versus, I think, uh, maybe what a more nuanced perspective would, would give us insight into. I mean, market forces tell us that for many essential services jobs, because there's a huge supply of workers available for these jobs, many of the jobs don't require a lot of skills or there are very few barriers to entry, um, you know, the pay that people get in these jobs tends to get pushed down to very, very low levels, right? And that's just the logic of the market. But if we think about it a bit more carefully, we'll realize that the value that a lot of these jobs generate is actually quite far in excess of the wages that people are paid. Um, essentially, what a lot of these jobs are about is saving people who have a lot more money and earn a lot more. It's about saving them time uh, so that they don't have to do these things themselves, right? It's about saving you, for example, the time that you need to take public transport or to own and maintain your own car, the time you need to go you know, across the road to buy something for takeout from the shops. And if you think about a type of worker which is producing huge value, foreign domestic workers in Singapore, it's about freeing up people to put more time into the labor market, right? So a lawyer can return to work, earn $20,000 a month in exchange for paying a foreign domestic worker all in maybe $1,000 or less, right? once you include everything, including living expenses and so on. Now, that creates, you could say, $19,000 of value, but you know who captures that, right? I mean, most of it actually gets, ends up getting captured by the employer in that case, because the logic of the market says for every one foreign domestic worker in Singapore, there's maybe 10,000 more somewhere else willing to come to Singapore to do that job. And I think, you know, if we think about it a bit more carefully, we'll realize that quite often we're actually logically inconsistent in how we think we, when, I mean, in, in whether we think we should or shouldn't apply market forces to tell us whether something is right or wrong. Let me give you an example. When it comes to contracting for essential services, all of us think that the natural thing to do is to find the cheapest provider of these services, right? If you are, let's say, on your condominiums management committee, you're contracting for security or landscape services, your, um, you know, your constituents, the people who are living there and paying management fees, they're going to file uh, you know, complaints against you if you go and select a provider, which is more expensive and the cheapest, because you say they're better quality or whatever, they're not going to be happy. But when it comes to high-end personal and professional services, that logic of going for the cheapest provider is thrown completely out of the window. If you're sitting on the corporate board and your question is, I want to engage a lawyer to you know, handle our takeover negotiations of another company. If you went to the board and you said, hey, I'm going to get the cheapest lawyer possible. You'd be laughed out of the room. They would say, no, for this kind of important service, we need to go for reputation for quality. Get the best lawyer for the job. So that's the problem we're facing, right? For certain classes of services, we say the market is what we should go with. The market says, let's go to the cheapest. They're all the same anyway. You know, let's drive prices down to the minimum possible. For others, there is actually a system whereby I think vested interests basically steer the conversation in the direction of quality and therefore allowing people to basically charge, you know, fairly high prices for their services without asking or subjecting these 
uh, players to the same amount of competition that they want to subject low-end services to. So I think it's a bit of a problem we have to deal with. Thanks very much, Walter. Um, and the last question that we'll take from the floor um, is for Danny. Um, and this is from Rudy um, Kabalida. Um, and the question is specifically on the impact of COVID-19 to third world countries in terms of the economy. Um, and how would you, they bounce back from such a pandemic? And how would you suggest that their governments um, cope with the impacts of the pandemic? Yeah. On well, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Rudy, for that question. It's, it's really interesting because the view of the world that we've got is that the rich countries are dealing with COVID-19 well. They've got lots of, they've got deep reserves to, to do fiscal expenditure. They have, you know, whiz-bang uh, public health infrastructure. Here's the interesting thing. Some of the worst experiences around the world under COVID-19 have been precisely in the rich countries because there are some very terrible experiences in poor countries as well. But there are many countries that, you know, um, I don't know that we'd say third world, but emerging economies who've done remarkably well in this COVID-19 uh, experience. Vietnam has had very low infection rates, has had up until yesterday, uh, as far as I know, zero deaths still, and they're working very hard at keeping it that way. Uh, around our region, Malaysia, Brunei, uh, all at uh, Myanmar, all have had actually relatively, it, it, it's, not, it's not a walk in the park being hit with COVID-19, but how you respond to it, how you keep your people safe, speaks well for how you are governing, taking care of their well-being. And in many countries that are emerging countries, they're actually doing remarkably well. So I'm going to take your question as being, how do all countries in the world uh, navigate their way out of this? What are the things to look out for? Things to look out for are public debt, monetization, uh, you know, extreme liquidity in the economy, uh, making sure that some businesses, as we come out, that need to fail actually do fail. Otherwise, we've got raging inflation and we've got high nominal interest rates that will put underwater a lot of otherwise viable businesses. On the economic side, it is a very difficult journey that we've got going forwards. Uh, in Singapore, we've been very lucky. We've been able to finance the, the, the fiscal spending from just reserves alone. Uh, many, many other nations are not going to have that luxury and they will have a delicate journey going forwards. It's very unfortunate that not all emerging economies, even in our neighborhood, have been able to keep COVID-19 under control. There are experiences around that I know we all, we've all read about in, in different nations uh, across South Asia, in parts of uh, parts of Southeast Asia, where the, the pandemic is being much less well handled. And it, it is going to be a serious issue how we come out of both the infection and the economic recovery there. But I think in, in the, the point that I might get across is that many so-called emerging nations, many third world nations have actually managed this quite well. They've based, they've learned from the past, the previous experiences they've had, will continue to accumulate those experiences. So it will be a, a sort of not a disastrous journey going forwards. It will be a measured journey going forwards that we will continue to be able to get, uh, to bring people out of extreme poverty in this part of the world. Thank, thank you very much, Danny. Um, and now it brings us to the concluding remarks of both speakers, and I do have a prompt for them. Um, and um, I'll give them the prompt, and they have two minutes to kind of give their concluding remarks. So the prompt is, crises are not new. And even after the 1997 Asian financial crisis or the 2008 global financial crisis, we have seen the economy returning pretty much to business as usual without any profound changes to structures and institutions. How do we ensure genuine structural change towards a fairer economy rather than simply reinscribing the same dynamics as before? And since we started off with Danny, perhaps Walter can close us off first. So this is um, also a concern I, I share very much that in trying to address COVID-19, we're going to call it 
mission accomplished after we simply try to turn the clock back and you know, restore the economy the way it is in 2019. And I think um, this problem, this question could, should concern more than just progressives who think that structural reform is needed to improve societal outcomes to address the worst effects of excessive inequality. I think it should also concern conservatives, it should concern big business, uh, because I think if they think about the situation more carefully, they should be acutely aware that their ability to build and retain wealth actually depends on social stability. And it really comes back to the narrative. The social narrative that we have in many countries is that the current levels of social and economic inequality, the current social, the current economic structure is acceptable because, for example, it might have brought a lot of people out of poverty. I think that's one of uh, Danny's points there, that one should look more carefully at whether the system succeeds in bringing people, uplifting people from poverty, not just measuring it based on inequality alone, right? So that's one. And the other reason why people think that the current structure is acceptable is because they think people have a chance to succeed. But I think this social consensus is more fragile than it appears. I think it rests in many countries on mistaken beliefs that people have about the real nature of the economy and how much social mobility actually exists empirically. So I think the solution is we need more centrism in politics. We need more stakeholder engagement. I think in Singapore's case, I think we need much more participation from civil society, from think tanks, from academics in building ideas for Singapore alongside business, workers, and the government. And I'm also going to agree here with, with Danny that uh, what we really need is to have, I think, pretty difficult conversations about how to measure success and what we really mean when we throw around these big words like inequality, democracy, you know, stakeholders, and so on, because I think we have to know what we're aiming for. Otherwise, all we'll have is a lot of conversations and not much practical progress at the end of it. That's it, I think. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Amanda, for, for that question also. It's a wonderful question. I might also add to your list of, of other things that we've gone through, SARS 2003, MERS, Ebola, a range of other pandemics. So, so let me say, why didn't the world change after those? Why in this conversation am I pushing the line that the world could, could well change as a result? I think that there are a number of reasons. Um, SARS 2003, for all the, the scary things that it was in this part of the world, was actually relatively localized and short-lived. Basically, within four months, Singapore was declared SARS-free, right? Within a very short time, China itself was also. And so it we got, we in this part of the world actually got good things out of that. We developed a playbook for how to deal with these things. So even though it was short-lived, it did change the world, at least here. And it would and actually benefited us hugely that when January 2020 came around, we had a playbook to go to. Okay, the rest of the world did not. Uh, Asian financial crisis, 1997, global financial crisis, 2008. Those were large. Asian financial crisis was relatively localized. Global financial crisis was actually localized in the transatlantic region. It was mostly a North America and Western European phenomenon, but it did bring the global economy to the brink of disaster. I think that the reason there were lots of changes that came out of that, there were not more fundamental changes because uh, for many people in the world, these large financial crises were distant, abstract things. They understood that their pension money wasn't as strong. They understood that they had lost an investment. But collateralized debt obligations, changing regulations, capture of interests of regulators, that was all somebody else's problem. It didn't have to deal, didn't have to do with them. And the vested interests that kept that system going remained. No prominent banker went to prison or suffered for the global financial crisis. A lot of the practice on financial innovation, securitization has remained because it was all distant and abstract. Vested interests did not change. So previously we had localized uh, problems. They were short-term, vested interests remained and they were distant and remote. All of that changed with 2020 and the current uh, COVID-19 because it suddenly become deeply personal. We are now 
for a long time potential carriers. And we look around at our neighbors and we check out, are they wearing a mask? Are they doing social distancing? It has become something extremely personal. This time, it is personal. And while all of that's happening, the economic impact is huge. I mean, the IMF is estimating perhaps, you know, four to five, maybe six to seven percent decline in global economic activity. Just one fact, in the United States, the U unemployment rate is the highest that it's been in 90 years. And it took only 60 days to get there from the lowest that it's been in the last 50 years. This is a shock that has a depth and a scale and a spread that's unprecedented at the same time that it's deeply personal. So although for all the bad things that is happening, for all the things that our governments need to be doing to bring us out of this, I do feel that it is really shaking up the system and will move us forwards if we are sensible and wise about it to something better. So back to you, Amanda. Thank you very much to our two professors of economics, um, Professor Danny Kwa and Pro Professor Walter Becerra, for bringing us a conversation that extended far beyond the economy to touch upon social narrative, um, social compacts, the difficult conversations we need to have politically, and right down to the very personal nature of this crisis you know, us and our bodies as carriers of this virus. And thank you very much to our audience um, on the webcast for joining in um, and have a lovely Tuesday afternoon. Evening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs>